so we'll get started again. Um, one thing that's not mentioned in the notes, but is uh, it's discussed in your book on page 175, is the difference between total slack and free slack. So uh, it's also in the diagram on page 173, which is figure 6.8. It shows you some figures that are total slack TS and free slack, which is zero, or uh, in some cases zero. And the thing is, um, you cannot have, um, you don't have free slack on every node, you have it at the end of a chain. So what it, the free slack is the available slack at the end of a chain of a series of events. So in this case, um, let me see, we had a, um, okay, so here we have a free slack or a total slack of 165. And that means, um, and here there was a total slack of zero. And um, yes, so the preceding, um, so that means the free slack here is also uh, 165. But the free slack here is uh, is zero because it's part of this chain, and the only place that there's free slack is at the end of the chain of a series of events. And if it's um, <coughs> so, if you if you looked on the image on on page one seventy three, there was a, a series where you have uh, the total slack was fifteen on the top on the top series. And then the free slack on the at the end of the row was 15, but the free slack on the preceding nodes uh, was uh, was zero because it's um, they're proceeding in the same chain of events. But if you have, um, and that would also go for like the first one is also part of a chain is part of the chain. Um, but this is, um, th so the, this is zero here, and the free slack in this, the total slack here is zero. So that means then if this is part of this chain, this would also be zero. Um, no, but that's, I guess maybe I need to pull up the picture from the book because it's hard to see it with that example. Just end the show. I'm gonna go to the book. The idea is if, if you, you can use up some of your free slack on the preceding nodes, but if you use up the free slack on the preceding nodes, then uh, you have less to use up later along the chain. So you have to notify the work package leaders of the uh, succeeding nodes along the chain so that they know that there's less uh, free slack available to them later on. And that's, um, so it says the definition is free slack, it is the amount of time on activity uh, that can be delayed, an activity can be delayed without delaying and immediately following successor activity. The free slack is the amount of time an activity can exceed its earlier finish date without affecting the early start date of the successor. So we go to chapter six. On page, there's a 
picture of it on page 173. It's a different page in the fifth edition. And here you can see that the total slack here is 15, and that's what is in the, um, that would, this is what we calculated. And here the total slack is 15, and here it's 15. But the free slack is only given to the last node in the, in the line, in the chain. So it's 15 is the free slack here. But it's zero here and zero here. But if something gets used up earlier, then this will have less uh, free slack available. And uh, this one is, there's only one uh, node in this intermediate chain. So the free slack is equal to the total slack here, because there's nothing preceding it. And then um, these are chains that are not part of the critical path. So we have, there's no slack here because this is part of the critical path. Okay, so that means that something in this path could be delayed and there's this up to the amount of slack time that you have, it could be a delayed without affecting what is the critical path of this network. So they have a different picture in the version 6. It's on figure 6 on page 173, but it shows the same concept. And they have one example in the non-critical path where you have a total slack of 35 and a free slack of 35. Okay, so that's the uh, point on, on that one. We should go back to the other. Okay, so this is where we left off. Okay, um, they were talking about the when you're creating these um, networks, some things that you can could, should consider. Um, one of the things is that you should have. Um, um, the, num the amount of detail that you use uh, should be considered and that uh, these types of um, um, networks help you to um, limit the amount of detail. Uh, you should make sh sure you um, use activity numbers so that you, and you, that you don't include any loops in the networks. So you can't have any logic errors in the network. And that uh, you should um, 
they say that you can use uh, software to organize uh, these, the, the design of these networks. So they use uh, different types of software like Gantt charts, which will show the dates when you have the start dates and the finish dates and how much the range of time that can be used in each of the activities. So sometimes these softwares will also list what is the free time and the free slack time and the total slack time in the, in the different events. So to have a network that has a loop is not allowed in these. And this is another example of how it could be written up. Like this is, uh, we showed in the example one way of, of writing it up, but sometimes programs take up different um, visualizations of the same idea. And this is what would be an example of a Gantt chart um, where you show uh, visually, the amount of time it takes, you have the uh, the late start and the late finish date, and you have um, the amount of you 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 can have the target time when you want to start and finish, and then you can also mark down as you're doing the project when you actually are uh, starting and finishing. So sometimes they use different colors to indicate uh, what has actually happened from what is planned in the network. And this is a good tool to make sure that you're on time on in the, on the, in schedule on the plan. Uh, different techniques can be used to uh, ex um, try to uh, match up the drawings of this network with what you actually do in reality. And something that's called laddering or to break activities into segments so that you can start working on different things at the same time before you are actually finished with an activity. And that's an example of this is because it might take too long to do something and even though you identify it as one activity and um, you want to be able to um, do other things in parallel. So from drawing the chart, it doesn't necessarily make sense for what you're doing in the real project. So they have an example of this is, um, the, they call it um, uh, digging a trench and laying a pipeline and then refilling the pipeline. If you're doing this for a mile long pipeline, then you would want to be, you might be able to dig one third of the trench and then you start laying the pipeline. And then when you're done laying the pipeline, you fill the pipeline, but you're not doing this. You don't dig the one mile trench, you dig part of the trench and then you start doing the next step, and then you continue to dig the rest of the trench and so forth. So uh, laddering is breaking up these activities into, into sections and doing different things at the same time. Another thing that can be done is lags, and that's um, lag is the minimum amount of time a dependent activity must be delayed to begin or end. So sometimes you can't start an activity until something else is done. Or sometimes you can't finish an activity until something else is done. And so these are restrictions on what you can actually do. So lengthy activities are broken down to reduce the delay in the start of successor activities. And so you make the activity smaller. And lags can be used to constrain the finish to start or the start to start, or the finish to finish, and the start to start combination relationships. So this is like showing you the relationship between activities. Okay, so this is the uh, picture of the laddering. So you have um, a pipeline that you need to put in the ground, and maybe it's going to be a mile long, and you have to dig a trench for it. So you dig one third of the trench, and then while you're digging the second third of the trench, you're still you're laying down the pipeline in the first third of the trench. And then when you're uh, digging the third part of the trench, you're laying down the pipeline in the second part of the trench, and you're filling in the first part of the trench. So you're doing things in parallel at the same time. And that's what they mean by breaking up the activity of digging, laying down, and refilling the trench. Uh, there's different kinds of 
uh, relationships. Sometimes you have to finish an activity before you can start the next activity. Sometimes you have to uh, start the activity before you can start the next activity. So these are the different relationships which the people working with the activities know how this relates to one another. And <coughs> in something like this, you might have a, a start to start relationship where you have <coughs> uh, activity N can not start until uh, activity A is started. But maybe in this case, they, are, they don't show it here, but it has a lag of zero. So that means this can start at any time and it doesn't have to wait for this. <coughs> but if there is a requirement, like for activity Q, to wait for activity P to start, then maybe activity, and that lag is five, say it's five days, then activity Q cannot start until five days after activity P starts. It doesn't mean activity P has to finish because it's a start to start relationship. So it's a, when this one starts, five days later, this one can start. In the finish to start relationship, we have this one has to finish before this one can start. And so they have also, this is the uh, start to start relationship uh, for the, the, the trench. You dig uh, one third of the trench, and then there's a three day delay before you can uh, maybe uh, lay the pipe in the first third of the trench. And then there's a three day delay before you can do it in the next part. So it's not. Uh, because you're only digging maybe one third of the mile, you're not digging the whole mile. <coughs> okay. So this is what they call concurrent engineering in the book also. <coughs> The picture that they use in the book is showing a finish to start is replaced by a start to start relationship. So uh, they have, uh, when you have to finish this before you can start this, that this is a tra traditional sequential approach. In the concurrent engineering approach, they, they change it to a start to start approach relationship. So this has to start. And after a certain amount of time, this one is allowed to start. So they're not waiting for this to finish. And this is supposedly a process that shortens the amount of time for the product to get to market. So they're using this start to start relationship rather than waiting for the previous phases to finish. So um, sometimes lags can be used in combinations. Um, in the finish to finish relationship, you have to finish the one previous uh, activity before you can finish the the next activity. And it doesn't mean you can't you can start testing before, but you're never going to be done testing unless this one is done already. So that's a condition. And then the start to finish relationship, you have to um, start the testing uh, before you can uh, finish the documentation. So that makes sense. And these, in, these impose certain lags on the, on the completion of the project. And then there can be some combination of the two. So you may have to start coding before you can start debugging. And you have to finish coding before you can finish debugging. Okay, um, so this is the use of network lags. We have, um, so we have our legend here. This is our, uh, the latest start is zero, and the slack is 
zero and we have the relationship here is a start to start relationship and this one is a finish to start relationship and um, So this one is trying to show that uh, on a forward pass we have activity D for example uh, when that finishes at 16 if you add a lag of 2 we get an um, earliest finish time of 8 18 so this is making use of the lags in this relationship to show the effect on the um, the earliest finish time because this lag imposes an extra delay here. If we have a delay here of uh, earliest start on, on a lag of two here, this is uh, supposedly, this is not affecting uh, the critical path. But then we have here this 18, there's a lag of 2, and that imposes a lag, then imposes the earliest finish of 20. So um, depending on if these impose extra lag times, you have to see if the lag times are occurring on the critical path as to whether or not they affect uh, the, the, earliest the earliest finish time. Uh, with the backwards pass, we have uh, for activity A, we have the LS of uh, 3 here uh, on B minus a lag of 3 gives us a uh, LS of 0, latest start time of 0. So this was the examples that they use. Um, it says, <coughs> it says, note how an activity can have a critical finish or a critical start. A, fin a critical finish or start. Activity E and F have critical finish of slack zero. So this has criti critical finish of slack zero. But their activity starts have 4 and 12 days of slack. So they have activity starts have 4 and 12 days of slack. Okay, it's only, uh, the, fi it's only the finish of activities E and F that are critical. Conversely, the activity of A has a zero slack at the start, but has 5 days of slack to the finish. So the critical path follows the activity start and finish constraints that occur due to the use of the additional relationship added by the imposed lags. So, um, so the the you can see the critical path because we have the the slack of zero on the cl critical path. And this is the, the finished uh, slack here. And this is an imposed on the start. Um, in, in the sixth edition of the book, there is an S, um, there's, a there is a relationship uh, diagram on page 185 and 186. And it's uh, the same diagram as this one. Okay. Okay, the other thing is um, they mentioned a hammock activity. Just So the hammock uh, 
is the EF of the last activity that was act, um, and that's minus the ES of the first activity. And that's the inner chain. So the havoc activity is activity that spans over segments of a project and it determines um, how you aggregate uh, pieces of the, of the project and it can be used in like indirect costs, for example. So this one shows that the EF of the last activity, um, which is uh, in the chain, which is this one, minus the EF of the first activity in the chain, which is this one, goes into here. And this becomes a, an additional activity that kind of crosses the activities. And then the, the hammock is eight, of duration eight. So this is kind of for indirect costing. You also can put this in as well. So the duration of the hammock activity is determined after the network plan is drawn. And these are to aggregate sections of the project to facilitate the right amount of detail for specific sections of the project. Okay. So it's used in assigning indirect uh, project cost to the project. Okay, so <coughs> um, we basically went through what each of the, the symbolism is of each of these uh, um, AON uh, networks. And uh, you can figure out how to fill in the forward path values and the backward path values and the slacks and the estimated uh, network uh, time. And um, we're not going to do with so much with the hammock activities, but you should go through the examples in the book on the last, um, in the section on the lag, which is on page 185 to like 187, and just go through the examples and see how they calculated this. So. But uh, basically, the lag, the lag here was in a um, a finish to finish relationship, and this this one was in a start. Uh, let me see. This one is start to start relationship, and then this is start to finish relationship, or finish to start relationship rather. So you can see by where the arrows are what the relationship is that's imposing on the lag. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, we just, I'm not going to go through the other part of this note set, but I just wanted to point out in the book something, which is, uh, it's in this in the book. <coughs> if you go to exercise, it's Okay, so um, in exercise, your exercise is number two. You have to do uh, number two, which is 
this one here that's listed in your well, in your mandatory exercises but a similar example to this is exercise number three and if you look at uh, it says uh, draw a project network from the following information uh, this is something you know how to do and it's it's fairly easy to do it but you could also go to the appendix of the book and because this one's with the stars have the answers in the back of the book okay so you can look in the back of the book to the answer for this one <coughs> number 11 is another example of this uh, ones that haven't had a solution in the appendix and so if we look at a large eastern city is requesting federal funding for park and ride project one of the requirements is the re is the request application in a network for a plan for the design phase of the project and then the, the chief engineer wants you to develop a project plan to meet this requirement um, So the, um, the, 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 this is the project and the duration times. So show your project <coughs> network with early activity, late, and slack times. <coughs> Mark the critical path. <coughs> so starting from this, you should be able to go <coughs> to the example <coughs> in the appendix. <coughs> and that's on... Uh, page uh, 628 of the book or 629 rather mm. maybe it's a different page in this book Okay, so this is the um, the answer to question six eleven in the book, and uh, so you should be able to go from the IDs and the descriptions and the duration times, and be able to fill in uh, the um, the all of the points in the legend, so that you can. <coughs> Um, you can compute the forward pass, the back pass, and the compute the activity slack and identify the critical pass and how many days it will take uh, to do the project. So the project here it says will take 155 days, uh, and then the critical pass we can say is zero 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 zero. So we know that that's the critical pass. And that um, if we did the forward pass, we do it as we had computed before. Uh, and then we do the backward pass and we compute the, the so forward pass, we compute the LS and the, um, yeah. Um. So we compute the EF and the DS and the EF on the forward, and then the LS, LF and the LS on the backwards, and um, and then we can compute the slack times after that. Okay, so this is an example that 
If you can do this with the example in the book, then you can do that also for the exercise as well. So it shouldn't be so, so difficult to do. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do today. And remember, there's no lecture next week. So um, you can also remind your friends there's no lecture next week. And we're working on getting a um, couple guest lectures in. So hopefully that will be on the agenda then afterwards.